On Contact with Chris Hedges. Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the new gig economy with taxi cab driver John McDonough. This is the race to the bottom, where you're working more and more hours for less and less wages. And, you know, this new gig economy between, you know, it'll work, I'll pick up somebody or somebody will use, say, Uber to go to an Airbnb who will get on his phone and order something from Amazon to eat in his house. I, I mean, all those jobs are now all gone from cashiers to, you know, making a living as a cab driver. It's just, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a blacksmith or a typesetter at a newspaper business trying to explain to you what the yellow cab industry used to be, we're now becoming obsolete. John McDonough has been driving a New York taxi cab for nearly 40 years. He mounted a one-man show called Off the Meter, On the Record. He also hosts a radio show on WBAI. So, John, let's talk about you get out of the Army, volunteer for the Army at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, Go to Germany, I think. Yeah, I was stationed oh, there. Stationed in Germany. Fortunately, not in, did not go to Vietnam. Come back and start driving. What was it like then? Well, uh, at that time, working out of the garages, you got a percentage of whatever you made that night. So if you had a bad night, the garage had a bad night. And in Manhattan, you could actually park and go eat and not worry about tickets. I mean, it was a lot easier. But then on the flip side, there were a lot more, it was a lot more violent, a lot more robberies, particularly down in the Lower East Side. It was like a drug den. You were taking people from other neighborhoods to go down to avenues A, B, C, and D. We called it the alphabet jungle. And and uh, you were doing a drug run. A person would ask you to say, listen, can you pull over at that burnt out building there? And you'd say, can you wait for me? Now, you were going to wait because you weren't going to pick up anybody else. And, you know, a couple of things could happen. He goes into the building, he comes out, and then you go, you take him back to where you picked him up. So it was that type of thing. I think now they probably have an app for it. But, right. uh, we, we don't but what do about uh, in, the ability to make a living? Make a sustainable well, you, income. you could make a living, but everyone shared the burden. The garage shared it. The driver shared it. If you had a good night, the garage made money. If you had a bad night, you split it. That, that's not the case anymore. Right now, we're leasing. I, I lease. I drive a day shift, and it's 12 hours. It's $120 for the lease and $30 for the gas. So before I make $1 at 4 in the morning, I'm $150 in the hole. And, and that's pressure that's on you. You're out there hunting for that fare, and now it's getting less and less and just the, the, the pressure is unbelievable but when you started out what were you pulling were you pulling a sustainable income yeah, just, you, yeah. you could make a living I mean and, you and could support a making. family off of yes you, you could and also your dream was to buy a medallion which was a million dollars right no 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 back then it would have been a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars now no before Uber, it was $1.1 oh. 1. 1 million. Right, this right. was only two or three years ago. Right, right now, it's $150,000. Wow, and it's considered a risky investment. Banks will not give you a loan to buy a medallion because they say it's a risky investment. I never thought I would ever hear the day that a yellow medallion would be a risky investment. It was always considered like having a seat on the stock exchange, and that was what it was compared to. And, and it would go up 10 to 20 percent every year, the value of the medallion. So what happened was drivers that had the medallion would take out now another loan, and the banks would loan you the money because they know the price of it's going up. And if you defaulted, they wanted that medallion because uh, they could sell it for there's more. A, it's a limit. What are there, 19? How many medallions? Are well, there's there? a little over 13,000 medallions there's in the city. There's 19,000 cabs in the city. Is that right? Roughly. No, no. With yellow cabs, there'd be only a little over 13,000 okay, yellow cabs. Okay, but 19,000 cars. Is that the correct Oh, well, number? you could have more cars and then shift the right. medallions. Like at the garage, they would have more cars that are in for repairs so they could take the medallion and move it over right, to right. another car. But the, the, So the, let's talk about what's happened. because the, the and, and I think it's emblematic of what's happened throughout the entire economy. Um, when you began driving... Uh, you could pull in enough annually to support a family, yourself, uh, and then all of that began to crater. Explain how that process. Well, it, it all started when the apps started coming in. And in the beginning, it wasn't so bad because people were getting used to it and knew and people didn't trust it, maybe. But then as... And what year was that? 
would you say, roughly? About, about two or three years ago. Okay. And uh, the city council allowed that in. But it's not just Uber. Uber came in, and then on the coattails would have been Lyft, right. Get, Via, Juno. And there's another one called Chariot right now, which is a van that does algorithms that takes you from neighborhood to neighborhood if enough people sign up for it. So Manhattan now is being cut up piece by piece with every different app. And there's just less and less people... Uh, flagging you down or, or doing the e hail Because right now, uh, I mean, I get people get into the cab and they go, oh, the, I love yellow cabs now. I can get them anytime I want. That, that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear it was a little bit tough because they were busy at that time. So the apps have just completely destroyed it. And what's going on is the yellow cab industry didn't keep up with the new technology. Like, we have two apps now called Curb and Arrow. No one knows about them. The city doesn't promote it. And yet it would benefit the city because every fare we pick up, there's a 50 cent surcharge for the MTA, for the, uh, the transit, and there's 30 cents to have wheelchair accessibility in the yellow cabs. So they're not promoting it. They're losing tons of money, and Uber's getting away without being regulated. Let, let's talk a little bit about what, what's that done. Well, first of all, what's it done to the income of cab drivers? Oh, it's cut it in half. Uh, I explained it to you before. The, we're now fighting at the TLC, wanted to limit yellow cab drivers to 12 hours a day, and there was a protest. Yellow cab drivers were protesting that they have to work a 16-hour day in order to make a living. So it is just cut everything, and everybody's fighting for that extra fare. I'm you, you would be at a light, just say, with two or three other yellow cabs, and if you saw someone up the street with a, a, a luggage, you would run the lights to get to them because that might be an airport job. So you're risking your own life, and you're, you're risking getting tickets. You're doing things you would never have done before. You would have said, ah, I'll let that go because I'm going to get another fare. What's, the, what's it done to, to cab drivers themselves? Well, it, what, the how, stress. What's the effect? It, it, it is just the stress. Not only we don't have any health care, but sitting for those 12 to 16 hours a day, you're getting diabetes, there's no blood circulation, you're putting on weight, and then there's that added stress that you're not making any money, that when you go back after a 12-hour shift, like I work out of a garage, never mind owning the medallion and have to pay in a mortgage and have banknotes coming in and stuff like that. So it, it's just constant pressure and constant searching, and then you're worried about get, not getting any tickets, particularly here in Manhattan, you can't make certain turns on certain corners. You can't block the box during Christmas time. You can't turn in. The cops are giving you tickets. The taxi and limousine are giving you tickets. So now you got to pay them off. I, I, I mean, it, it's just, it is one of the most stressful jobs in the city. And you, you talked about how you walk, where well, you drive out the door. You're already $150 right. in the hole. Yes, you, before you, the first And you fare. potentially can come back at the end of the day and owe money. Oh, yeah, and that is happening. We have, at our garage, immigrant drivers are just starting Which out. Which are what, 80%, I think, of cab drivers? Yeah, they would be from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. And, and to me, it's amazing that they would even take the job not knowing the city, because I'm born and raised in Queens. And when I first started driving, I was just nervous. People jumping in and yelling out an address, and you had to know where to go. And if you didn't, they're yelling at you, what kind of driver are you? So here Well, you, they have Google Maps, so they can... That, that is different. That is... I, I get people now telling me, excuse me, driver, Google just said, make a left there, and I go, did it? I, I didn't know that. So, no, that, that is happening, but there, new immigrant drivers will work a 12-hour shift, come back to the garage, and owe money wow. for the lease and the gas, but they're doing it to get the experience of driving and to feel the city but what about what about drivers that have been doing this for many years? What's happening? Well, they're just getting less and less. They might know how to play the city, like know when certain Broadway shows let out or know there's a concert at Madison Square Garden and stuff like that, and know at certain time frames where to go around the city, which takes years to learn and, and find out the rhythm of the city. But even that's all gone because everybody's just staring into their phones and, and, and clicking because, you know, you had the option. You can either stand out in the corner, jump up and down, flail your arms, or you can sit in a bar or up in your apartment and just hit the note, and then it says your driver's outside. So, so there have been at least three suicides among cab, New York cab Yeah, taxi but that, that's only that we know about. There, there would be guys probably committing suicide just in the quiet of their own home and just doing it. They couldn't take it. I mean, the thing about Douglas Shifter right. that made the news, yeah. Well, yeah, go ahead. Explain no, it's that he took it right to where the explain, problem is. Explain what he did. D Douglas Shifter... He was a livery driver. He was a, a, a black car livery driver. And he, let me just say that yeah. he, he, before he killed himself, wrote that he was working 100 to 120 consecutive hours almost every week for the past 14 years 
although when he began, he averaged 40 or 50 hours a week, and he said he just couldn't survive. He wrote, I'm not a slave. I refuse to be one. There seems to be a strong bias by the mayor and governor in favor of Uber. And so explain what happened. So early one morning, he drives right up to the front of City Hall. They have these gates and that you can't get in. And I talked to a cop who witnessed it that day because I was down at a vigil for him. And he said he just pulled up very calmly, put it in the park, took out a shotgun and, and blew his head off. And, and that, he left his manifesto on Facebook. I, I, this is the equivalent of what happened in Tunisia. There was uh, Mohammed Moya Azizi who killed himself there and started the Arab Spring because he couldn't take it, what was going on as a street vendor. And this would be sort of our Mohammed that he pulled up and that he couldn't take the pressure of what the government was doing to him and took away his life. Really, I mean, the, the blood, his blood is on the hands of the people in City Hall who have created the situation where we're not making anymore. We're destroying the industry. We're going to talk a little bit about how Uber uh, essentially uses lobbyists uh, so that they don't, uh, are, are really free of any kind of regulation or control. But before we do, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how cab drivers in New York have responded. And also, we should stress the fact that this isn't just New York. This is throughout the entire country. Well, you, you could even say just worldwide. And, and you see the different reactions to these apps coming in at different countries where they actually have strong taxi unions, uh, say, in, in France or in Germany, where they, there's pushback on it. Whereas here in New York City, we don't have it. I mean, we have the Taxi Workers Alliance. Now Uber is funding some sort of un, uh, union as, as a front. And then there, there's just different unions in different boroughs representing different ethnic groups. So we're, we're sort of split all around, which is, you know... You know we well, you also have a governor who, who accepts quite a bit of money from Uber. Right. Uh, Como. Well, well, the other thing is we have something that's known as the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And in order for Uber and all the lifts to come in, they had to have hearings on it. And I was at the hearings. So they are regulating Uber, Lyft, and Get. And what they're doing is, after they're done regulating, or not regulating, and let them in, they leave the Taxi and Limousine Commission and join the board of Uber and yeah. Lyft. Yeah, so, which was the head of the Taxi Limousine Commission in New York now works for, is it Lyft or Uber, right? Yeah, they, they're all, they're all leaving there, and now they can go back to their friends that are still left there and say, listen, if you pass this motion that's going through the Taxi and Limousine Commission, you know, when you get out, you can work and make a lot more money with all these other apps. So they're regulating the companies that they know that they're going to be working for later on. And it's corrupt. I mean, even our federal government, there's some something called a cooling off, that if you leave a Congress or a Senate, you, you can't join a lobbying group for a year to three years. We we don't have that law here in New York City. TLC members just go right from voting on something that's going to benefit them the day after they leave the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And is, am I right that, is it Uber and Lyft or Uber spent more money lobbying than Amazon and Walmart combined? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, but that, that's going on. I mean, they have the money. They're buying all the politicians. Right. And you could see it. It benefited them. They now are unregulated in the city. They've added 100,000 cars to New York City in the past two years, whereas there was only 13,000 cars for the last 50 years. So within two years, without environmental impact studies, without anything, what would it do to the city? So now we have congestion. So now what the city says, oh, well, we created this congestion. We're now going to put a congestion tax on to anyone coming into the city and taxing yellow cabs and Uber cabs and all of them with a, with a new price hike below 60th Street. So we're in this bizarre situation where they create a problem, and in order to solve it, they're putting it on the backs of drivers. Okay, we'll, we'll come back and describe how Uber works uh, after the break. Thanks.
Mark Twain said it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. That could be why America is so divided now, because people have been fed fake news paid for by corporate interests. They beat you down until you believe their fairy tales. Well, here's a story for you. It's called The Big Picture, and it's full of facts, not fiction. Question more. Chris Hedges. Welcome back to our discussion of the new gig economy uh, with taxi driver John McDonough. So let's talk about Uber, uh, which came into the market uh, two to three years ago, is, un is able to skirt all regulations, has reduced salaries of New York City cab drivers to 50 or less, fifty dollars or less a day. Um, how they game the system? Well, they gamed it when they first came in. They didn't come under the purview of, say, what a yellow cab is. The, the yellow cab has to be a certain vehicle, and it's a Nissan that the city picked that every yellow cab has to be the certain type of vehicle. Every yellow cab has to charge a certain price. When that drop goes down, that's regulated by the city. They added on all these extra taxes, like for the MTA, for the wheelchair, and uh, a rush hour tax. Uber comes in. No regulations at all. They can pick whatever type of car they want, whatever type of color of car. They can charge prices when it's slow. They can lower the prices. When it, uh, it's busy out on the street, they can do what's called uh, the they up their price, price surging, it's called. It could be two or three times, whereas the yellow cab is just plowing along at the same rate at the same time. Like going to Kennedy Airport from Manhattan is $52. No matter what the traffic is like, no matter how many hours it takes you to get there, whereas Uber will jack up their prices two or three times, and you might have to pay $100 to get out to Kennedy Airport. So while the yellow cab industry is just almost now regulated to death, the Uber is coming in with the new technology and figuring out different ways how we're going to make money and how we're going to do it. I, I was explaining before, I was at brunch with my daughter and some friends, and she says, well, we'll take Uber home and we can all split it. So between four people, it was $2 each. And we did it sitting there, and it popped up on your phone saying, uh, do you accept that you're sharing the cab with this person? So for less than taking a bus or a subway, those four people can get in and go to the next bar. We can't compete with that. But it's it's finished with the and, and what, what, what it's done is drive because the, the Federal Trade Commission fined Uber twenty five million dollars uh, for false advertising over bonuses. So they were using bonuses to lure drivers in. Right. But once those bonuses were paid, these drivers were reduced to the same poverty level wages that taxi cab drivers are now earning. Yeah, but when you split it all like that, where's the money? The, the drivers are not making any money. There's also a thing that's going on with Uber is they're now getting into the leasing car business. They have uh, car dealerships that'll sell you the thing. They're advertising, listen, you can have bad credit. Come down to Uber. We'll get you the money or the loan to buy this car. And what they do is then they take the money directly out of what you're making that day to help pay for the loan. So they can't lose. And if you go under... They sell the car back to the dealership, and then they redo it again for the next immigrant driver that comes in. So there's a whole scam going on, particularly with the, the way they're dealing with the uh, drivers. And a lot of immigrants are desperate. They're coming into the city. They might have bad credit. So they're guaranteeing you, don't worry about your credit. We'll get you the loan, and we'll get you the car. That sounds great. So here you're now with a brand new car, and you're out driving around, but you're noticing all your fares, it's all going to pay the loan. And you're working more and more hours for less and less money. And whatever that money is, that's going to pay off the loan for the car that Uber helped get you. We should also be clear that Uber and Lyft have used their lobbyists to exempt themselves uh, from existing labor laws. But th that's the price of doing business. You just talked about that fine. That probably means nothing to them to pay the fine. They'll just keep going in. I mean, you, you read about how Uber and Lyft come into a city. They just come in, they break all the rules, and then what, by the time the city can catch up to find out what's going on, because this is all new technology, to, even to the people in the city, and they say, whoa, what, what's going on here? You overwhelmed the whole system. And then they start fining them. But they can, that's the price of doing business. They make so much money. What does this say, backing off globally, about the new gig economy? You're kind of the case study for it in many ways. 
Yeah, I, I mean, as a yellow cab driver, you don't really see the world vision of it because you're just dealing so directly with what's going on with you. But, you know, there's that famous term. This is the race to the bottom where you're working more and more hours for less and less wages. And, you know, this new gig economy between, you know, it'll work. I'll pick up somebody or somebody will use, say, Uber to go to an Airbnb who will get on his phone <laughs> and order something from Amazon to eat in his house. I, I mean, all those jobs are now all gone from cashiers to, you know, making a living as a cab driver. It's just, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a blacksmith or a typesetter at a newspaper business trying to explain to you what the yellow cab industry used to be. We're now becoming obsolete. And uh, people are making a ton of well, money. I come out of the newspaper industry. Well, so they're typesetters. People yeah, might course. not even know what that is. Right, I mean, right. that, that, that's non-existent. And that's what I feel like what's going on with the yellow cab industry. What is this, gonna, what is this doing not only to taxi drivers who are able to make not an opulent but a, you know, a comfortable living, what, what is this going to do to the economy as a whole if, if it's unchecked? Well, it, it, it'll drive, say, immigrants coming in, which this used to be a great job to be a, a, a driver here in New York City. They're, they're going to drive them into other fields. I read an article recently. They're becoming taxi, uh, not taxi, but traffic agents here throughout the city. What's you, that? I don't know what that is. Uh, they, they stand on the corners at lights or at, say, the Midtown Tunnel or the Holland Tunnel and make sure you don't block the box and things like that. And then they give out tickets. So they're going into that industry instead of uh, driving anywhere because they're going to make it so low. People are just not going to go into it. You're going to have to go into another industry uh, as just they, they just overwhelm. It's like a tsunami. A, 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 an Uber tsunami has come through the city and it's just wiping out people left, right and center or the occupation anyway. Well, this, this gig economy is throughout the entire economy. And, right. and, it, and it's, it's taking jobs like, let's say, taxi driver jobs uh, reducing them to virtually slave substandard wages. But as you pointed out, that's in a series of industries. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, I think what's Uber valued at, $40 billion? The, the CEOs of these companies, people like Bezos, he's worth over uh, uh, three billion. I can't remember his valuation, but it's billions of dollars. Yeah, we won't be doing a fundraiser for him, so uh, <laughs> you know. But but even that, Uber. There's people come from the Obama administration. You know, go on to these boards, mm -hmm. and they tell you this is how the system works. This is how we'll get this through Congress. This is how we'll get it through the Taxi and Limousine Commission. So the people that actually know the system are now working for them and, and creating. There's never a study that said, "Whoa, let's slow down here. What will be the effect if we allow this to happen? Let's just take a couple of months off, and then if you can see, all right, this will be the effect. But how can we lessen the effect? No one's ever talked about that. Let's lessen the effect. Listen, we're not going to stop the new technology. It's coming, but we can make it a lot easier. What should be done? What are cab drivers doing? And if this is unchecked, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are Douglas Shifter pulling up at the city hall and killing himself. That all, that's the, the, the most extreme of the consequences. But it's just lowering the wage where you're going to work longer and longer hours. And then you're going to get... Well, you're already asking to work 16 hours. How many more hours can you yeah, work? Well, guys are sleeping in the cab. Like, they'll go out to, say, Kennedy... Uh, early in the morning, two or three in the morning, pull into the lot that's out there and go to sleep and catch the first flights that are coming in from California a couple of hours later. So that's, you'll, you'll have guys that won't go home for a couple of days. They'll just stay out on the street and just roam the street trying to make Which money. Which was dangerous. Oh, it's da dangerous for the passenger. You're going to see the, the amount of accidents will be going up because the drivers are drowsy and just the amount of cars that are coming in and the accidents that are happening. I, I, I mean, I... I I don't know what the answer is, but the one answer is we have to limit the amount of cabs, particularly here in New York City. If we did it for the yellow cab industry for 50 years, why can't we do it with Uber? Say, listen, we're limiting you right now. You cannot cab adding. I think uh, what they're saying now, they're adding 100 cars a week to the streets of New York. Uber is? Yeah. This, this is insane. There's, there's enough now. Like, when you have an Uber app and you, you click the button, the biggest complaint people are getting now is the cars are too quick. They're there within <laughs> two or three minutes. I can't even get dressed. Like, you used to call a car service. Ah, he'll be there in 20 minutes. So you didn't have to worry. With Uber, Lyft, and Get, you hit it. There's so many cars. And, and this is throughout all the boroughs, not just Manhattan. Those guys are there within two or three minutes because they're roaming empty throughout the whole city here, just waiting for that hit. And they're in the neighborhood, and they're right by you. you you've compared the plight of taxi drivers in New York 
the horses in Central Park. Yeah, well, this is a perfect example. Horses in Central Park are regulated, right? I think there's 150 of them. They make a great living there, the, the guys in the horse and buggy. Say Uber comes in. They say, listen, we want to bring in Uber horses, and we're going to add 100,000, and then de Blasio goes, say, well, let's see how the market will handle this. We know what's going to happen. No one will make money. They're all around Central Park, and no one can go anywhere because now there's 100,000 horses in Central Park. It would be considered madness to do that, and they wouldn't do it. But yet, when it came to the yellow cab industry, for 50 years, all we can have was 13,000 cabs, and then within a year or two, we're going to add 100,000. And you know what? Let's see how the market works on that. We know how the market works. We're getting it right now. You can't get up First Avenue because we got a bike lane. We got a bus lane. We got concrete barriers. We got trucks now that are double parking because they can't get near the sidewalk. So we can't even get up the street. Well, you talked about how the horses have health care. They get a vacation. Oh, well, they're members of the Teamsters <laughs> Union. They work less hours. They don't work in hot and cold temperatures. Oh, my God. As I said, if you're going to come back, you believe in reincarnation, come back as a horse in Central Park. And they all live in the west side of Manhattan. We're living in basements out in Brooklyn and Queens. We haven't upped our status in life, that's for sure. What, what did taxi drivers and other people who are victims of the gig economy, what do they have to do? Especially since, as you point out, the Democrat and Republican politicians have been completely bought off by these forces. I mean, the way it's going, you're going to have to find another job and another occupation because you, you're just not going to make it the way it's going unless they can bring in some sort of rules or regulations. I mean, they're talking about this congestion tax that's going to be below 60th Street and that they're going to start taxing every fare. Well, uh, look, I lived in France. I mean, when they started messing around with French farmers, they drove all their tractors into right. the streets of Paris and shut the city down. Don't you have enough cars to shut down New York? We, we do, but we're not that organized in order to do it. And it's so fragmented. Like, there's the yellow cabs, there's the green cabs, there's Uber, there's Lyft, there's Via, there's Juno, there's Chariot, as I said. And it, it's all catering to a different demographic or a different type of people in New York City. And to get them all together, it's, it's not that easy. You know, it's, it's a lot easier paying off the politicians to get what you want than actually organizing and trying to shut down the city. That's harder. Get a couple of billion dollars and then you'll get what you want. But isn't organizing really all we have? This isn't going to stop. I mean, this is only going to get worse. Well, allegedly now the city's looking into it. It's went to committee, which is probably where it goes to die. And they'll be talking and talking while Uber is refining and refining the app and making it that the customers like it because they're paying less fares, you know, less for their fares. So that's where you really needed to organize. If it was that bad and the customers were complaining, but you're not getting that, they're, they love it because they're paying cheap fares. So, I mean, it, I, I, listen, if I had the answers, you know, I'd be down at City Hall, but I don't. I, I just don't see. The city has to put its foot down. De Blasio is the progressive mayor here in New York City. He sees what the problem is. I mean, he tried at one stage to cap Uber cars, and he didn't get it done. That's because everybody else is being paid off. Right. Is there any city that's done it in America? Well, you mean fighting against yeah. them? I mean, you, you hear skirmishes. There's no battles. There's little things that you win here and there. And then what happens, Uber will just pull up stakes and just go to another city. I mean, they, they, they're making, I mean, you hear it about Walmart. Somebody organizes there. Well, we'll shut the, that Walmart down. Uh, we'll, we'll just end it. So, I mean, Uber's the same way, but they're entrenched in the city. I mean, all the apps now are here, but we have to find out a way where we can make a living, where everyone can make a living. I mean, you know, that, that, that's the way to go, but I, I don't know. I'm very pessimistic. Okay. Thanks, John. That was John McDonough, a New York City taxi cab driver for nearly 40 years. Thanks, John. Hey, thanks, Chris. Hedges. Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the new gig economy with taxi cab driver John McDonough. This is the race to the bottom where you're working more and more hours for less and less wages and you know this new gig economy between you know it'll work 
I'll pick up somebody or somebody will use, say, Uber to go to an Airbnb who will get on his phone and order something from Amazon to eat in his house. I, I mean, all those jobs are now all gone from cashiers to, you know, making a living as a cab driver. It's just, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a blacksmith or a typesetter at a newspaper business trying to explain to you what the yellow cab industry used to be. We're now becoming obsolete. John McDonough has been driving a New York taxi cab for nearly 40 years. He mounted a one-man show called Off the Meter, On the Record. He also hosts a radio show on WBAI. So, John, let's talk about you get out of the Army, volunteer for the Army at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, go to Germany, I think. Yeah, I was stationed oh, there. Stationed in Germany. Fortunately, not in, did not go to Vietnam. Come back and start driving. What was it like then? Well, uh, right. another car. But the, the, so the, let's talk about what's happened, because the, the, and, and I think it's emblematic of what's happened throughout the entire economy. Um, when you began driving, uh, you could pull in enough annually to support a family, yourself, uh, and then all of that began to crater. Explain how that process. Well, it, it all started when the apps started coming in. And in the beginning, it wasn't so bad because people were getting used to it and knew and people didn't trust it, maybe. But then as... And what year was that, would you say, about, roughly? About two or three years ago. Okay. And uh, the city council allowed that in. But it's not just Uber. Uber came in and then on the coattails would have been Lyft, right. Get, Via, Juno. And there's another one called Chariot right now, which is a van that does algorithms that takes you from neighborhood to neighborhood if enough people sign up for it. So Manhattan now is being cut up piece by piece with every different app. And there's just less and less people uh, flagging you down or, or doing the e hail Because right now, uh, I mean, I get people get into the cab and they go, oh, the, I love yellow cabs now. I can get them anytime I want. That, that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear it was a little bit tough because they were busy at that time. So the apps have just completely destroyed it. And what's going on is the yellow cab industry didn't keep up with the new technology. Like, we have two apps now called Curb and Arrow. No one knows about uh, At that time, working out of the garages, you got a percentage of whatever you made that night. So if you had a bad night, the garage had a bad night. And in Manhattan, you could actually park and go eat and not worry about tickets. I mean, it was a lot easier. But then on the flip side, there were a lot more, it was a lot more violent, a lot more robberies, particularly down in the Lower East Side. It was like a drug den. You were taking people from other neighborhoods to go down to having to use A, B, C, and D. We called it the alphabet jungle. And uh, you were doing a drug run. A person would ask you to say, listen, can you pull over at that burnt out building there? And you'd say, can you wait for me? Now, you were going to wait because you weren't going to pick up anybody else. And, you know, a couple of things could happen. He goes into the building, he comes out, and then you go, you take him back to where you picked him up. So it was that type of thing. I think now they probably have an app for it, but right. uh, we, we don't But what do about that. Uh, the ability to make a living, make a sustainable well, you, income? You could make a living, but everyone shared the burden. The garage shared it. The drivers shared it. If you had a good night, the garage made money. If you had a bad night, you split it. That, that's not the case anymore. Right now, we're leasing. I, I lease, I drive a day shift, and it's 12 hours. It's $120 for the lease and $30 for the gas. So before I make $1 at 4 in the morning, I'm $150 in the hole. And, and that's pressure that's on you. You're out there hunting for that fare. And now it's on them. The city doesn't promote it. And yet it would benefit the city because every fare we pick up, there's a 50 cent surcharge for the MTA, for the, uh, the transit. And there's 30 cents to have wheelchair accessibility in the yellow cabs. So they're not promoting it. They're losing tons of money, and Uber's getting away without being regulated. Let, let's talk a little bit about what, what's that done. Well, first of all, what's it done to the income of cab drivers? Oh, it's cut it in half. Uh, I explained it to you before. The, we're now fighting at the TLC, wanted to limit yellow cab drivers to 12 hours a day, and there was a protest. Yellow cab drivers were protesting that they have to work a 16-hour day in order to make a living. So it is just cut everything and everybody's fighting for that extra fare. I'm you would be at a light, just say, with two or three other yellow cabs. And if you saw someone up the street with a, a, a luggage, you would run the lights to get to them because that might be an airport job. So you're risking your own life and you're, you're risking getting tickets. You're doing things you would have never have done before. You would have said, ah, I'll let that go because I'm going to get another fare. What's the what's it done to to cab drivers themselves? Well, what, the how, stress. What's the effect? 
It, it, it is just the stress. Not only we don't have any health care, but sitting for those 12 to 16 hours a day, you're getting diabetes. There's no blood's getting less and less. And just the, the, the pressure is unbelievable. But when you started out, what were you pulling? Were you pulling a sustainable income? Yeah, just, yeah. you could make a living. I mean, and you could support a family off of it. Yes, you could. And also, your dream was to buy a medallion. Which was a million stage. dollars, right? No, no, no. Back then, it would have been a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. Isn't it a million now? No. Before Uber, it was $1.1 oh. $1. million. Right, this right. was only two or three years ago. Right, right now, it's $150,000. Wow, and it's considered a risky investment. Banks will not give you a loan to buy a medallion because they say it's a risky investment. I never thought I would ever hear the day that a yellow medallion would be a risky investment. It was always considered like having a seat on the stock exchange, and that was what it was compared to. And, and it would go up 10 to 20 percent every year, the value of the medallion. So what happened was drivers that had the medallion would take out now another loan, and the banks would loan you the money because they know the price of it's going up. And if you defaulted, they wanted that medallion because uh, they could sell it for there's more. An, it's a limit. What are there, 19? How many medallions? Are well, there's there? a little over 13,000 medallions there's in the city. There's 19,000 cabs in the city. Is that right? Roughly? No, no. With yellow cabs, there'd be only a little over 13,000 okay, yellow cabs. Okay, but 19,000 cars. Is that the correct Oh, well, number? you could have more cars and then shift the right. medallions. Like at the garage, they would have more cars that are in for repairs so they could take the medallion and move it over right. to